I have the pleasure of presiding today, and uh, I'm going to ask the first speaker, Dr. Kendrew, to come up here and begin his lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, sometime in the very early 1950s, my colleague Francis Crick gave a lecture in the Cavendish entitled, What Mad Pursuit? Most of you crystallographers are romantics, and uh, so you will certainly know that this is a quotation from a poem by Keats, The Ode to the Nightingale. And the full quote, full quote is, what men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Well, the point of Francis Crick's lecture was to show that all the methods then available for studying protein structure by X-ray crystallography were bound to fail. <laughs> The lecture had a somewhat discouraging effect on the audience, uh, which was headed by Lawrence Bragg. Could we have the first slide, please? I can't resist us having a picture of Lawrence Bragg on the left when he got the Nobel Prize, and on the right when I knew, first knew him. So uh, since the, the whole lab headed by Bragg was engaged in using just those methods to fail to get the structure, uh, it was discouraging. And at least one member of the audience, and that was me, presumably agreed with Francis Crick because it had been I that had suggested the title to him. <laughs> and uh, in parenthesis, may I say that I saw Francis in Cambridge two weeks ago. He's writing his autobiography, and he tells me the title is going to be What Mad Pursuit. <laughs> so, Going back to the poem, at that time there certainly was no wild ecstasy. It was rather a good deal of depression. But as you, as you also know, Francis and I were wrong to be depressed. And fortunately there were some others that I feel I, one should always pay tribute to, who also uh, were more optimistic than we were. The Medical Research Council, who financed us, the Rockefeller Foundation, Lawrence Bragg, David Kalin, they deserve to be, to, be, uh, to be remembered because for 10 years in that outfit we produced nothing uh, except incorrect structures. Uh, the next slide, please, is an example of an incorrect structure proposed by Max and myself. Uh, as we thought hemoglobin was, or might be, in 1947, I think. For at least we got the f one thing right, that hemoglobin was four myoglobins, and the myoglobin, four layers, one each for myoglobin, and four for hemoglobin. So, in spite of the fact that all the results were wrong, these bodies I've mentioned kept on giving us money. Uh, and I wonder sometimes, could it happen today? Uh, <laughs> in the United Kingdom, we feel rather unhappy about the amount of money that the uh, British government gives to science. And uh, one wonders whether, uh, how much money a group doing nothing for 10 years except wrong results, how easy it would be to get the funding. But uh, I'm not here to talk about uh, science politics today. There were other people around the place who rather agreed with, with Francis Crick that uh, the problem wasn't soluble. That was most of the professional crystallographers didn't think it could be done, and most of the biochemists, it had to be had to say, thought it couldn't be done. Well, I think that uh, there were two quite different kinds of reason why, in fact, it turned out it could be done and why all you people 
have got jobs today. Uh, one of those reasons is well known, and that reason is, of course, the heavy atom method. Uh, the method which I think was first, but Dorothy will tell me if I've got it wrong, was first talked about by Desmond Bernal, and then by Dorothy herself, and the first time it was applied in practice to a protein was, of course, as is well known, by Max Perutz and uh, Vernon Ingram. And uh, we had hoped that Max might be here today, and I'm sure he would have talked about that. But he can't be here today. I don't propose to say more about it, because, because it, the story is so well known, except to say that uh, I personally, at the time, found, found it a little depressing, because, you see, uh, the heavy atom had been stuck onto hemoglobin in a very rational way way. There was a sulfhydryl group, and what could be better for sticking a mercury atom onto? The trouble was that myoglobin, my protein, had no such sulfhydryl groups. And so we were reduced to the totally irrational method of taking every bottle off the shelf and pouring it into the crystals and seeing what happened. And by the way, that's what generally happens today. <laughs> So that says something about technological progress, and in fact, in fact, it's technological progress I want to talk about because I think the other major factor in making the structure work possible, uh, the other major factor was uh, dramatic improvements in technology which happened in the 1950s and which were not, for the most part, stimulated at all by the protein work. They just happened at the right time. And uh, I think it's perhaps worth mentioning these, because without them, uh, the structures could not have been solved. It wasn't... The problem, of course, was that uh, crystallography has always been, as you know, rather hard work and a lot of slave labor. And uh, Linus Pauling was telling us how he was directed to, into the profession of X-ray crystallography by noise. With me, it was almost the other way around. Uh, Bernal sent me to Cambridge to talk to Bragg about getting into doing some research. So Bragg introduced me to Max Perutz. So uh, I was going to work with Max. I went back to London, met Bernal. He said, how did it go? And I told him I was going to work with Max. Uh, Bernal looked very unhappy and said, heavens, I never intended you to become an X-ray crystallographer. It's a very tedious subject. You never learned it as a student. You won't like it at all. Uh, <laughs> So, but I was, by this time, my fate was settled anyway. Uh, not only was crystallography tedious in those days without the mechanical aids that we're used to now, but of course the biochemistry was tedious too. It may not be well known that uh, when Jim Watson first came to the Cambridge lab, at the very beginning he was not working with Francis Crick on DNA, he was working with me on myoglobin. And I used to make him get up at five in the morning to go down to the local slaughterhouse to pick up uh, horse hearts, which had just been removed from, uh, from slaughtered horses. And uh, also we were working on lampreys, which we thought had an interesting monomeric uh, heme protein. Uh, and lampreys, I don't know if you've ever handled a lamprey, it's a very slimy fish. Dissecting lampreys is not these. So after about three weeks of this, Jim Watson decided this was not for him, uh, <laughs> and and went off to what seemed to him an easier an easier assignment, which was to think about DNA. Well, to come back to these technical advances, which, as I say, were not for the most part stimulated by by the protein work. The first I shall mention is the only one that was directly stimulated, and that was the development of rotating anode X-ray tubes. When the work started, there were no, no X-ray, no rotating anode 
X-ray tubes. The diffraction patterns were very weak, the exposure times very long, and however long you made them, uh, you didn't get the spots in the outer part of the pattern anyway. And uh, in fact, it was our decision to hire somebody to design rotating anode X-ray tubes, Tony Broad, who built they were under development commercially at the time, but the first one which really worked satisfactorily was Tony Broad's X-ray tube, and that really made the whole program possible. It was not very reliable. New anodes had to be put in every three or four days, and uh, I still have one of them on my desk as a, as a paperweight. Um, but at least uh, most of the time, they produced X-rays and usable X and usable photographs. Uh, this was a kind of tour de force because the technique was completely new and unknown. So that was the first techni necessary technical advance. The second one was, uh, I would say, the precession camera. Uh, maybe we didn't have to have precession cameras, but it would have been tremendously inconvenient not to have uh, precession cameras, which certainly made indexing uh, much easier, and for this type of diffraction pattern were, of course, absolutely ideal. They appeared on the market at just the right moment. The third uh, necessary technical advance was densitometry. When I first joined Max, the routine was that you took uh, a series of pictures of a single reflection from your crystal through a pinhole, and you made a little uh, 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 set of, of, of photographs of one spot with different exposures, each differing from the last by a factor of perhaps 2 or 1.5, and then you held it up against your picture and compared them. And uh, this is how I was taught to do it, and of course the accuracy in determining intensities was never better than plus or minus 50 percent, I suppose. Um, and uh, it was only later, uh, when the work had already begun, that uh, it emerged, or I discovered by accident, that Peter Walker in Randall's laboratory in London had developed for quite other purposes a densitometer which would make a track across a photograph and would 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 produce a written a, a record of the of the uh, of the intensity and um, he had developed this this uh, densitometer for use in uh, studying s microscopic sections of cells and uh, the uh, X-ray application hadn't been intended at all. Later it was commercially produced, you well know, the Joyce Lobel densitometer. I was allowed to use this thing uh, after working hours. I used to take a train up four times a week, a train to London in the evening, and uh, spend a couple of hours in King's taking these traces and uh, measuring them up in the train going back to Cambridge. Uh, without densitometry, again, I think the work would simply have been, have been impossible. The last, of course, and most important of the technical advances was, was the computer. Uh, when the work began, the only aid to, uh, for, deter for calculating Fourier syntheses were the famous Beavers, Lips and Strips. And you had a box of these things, and you took out your strips and put them. You, you, I, you may or may not ever have used them. I doubt whether many of you have. Uh, they were extremely tedious. And at the end of it, you use punch card calculators to calculate the, calculate, do, the, do the work. In Cambridge, the EDSAC Mark I uh, computer arrived in the nick of time. It began to work, I think, around 1950 or something like that. Uh, it was, by modern standards, a very primitive machine with a power rather less than the pocket calculator you may have in your pocket at this moment. With uh, Perhaps the pocket calculator might be a little slower, but certainly it would have more memory. And by the way, the, of course, the Fortran had not been invented. Uh, the, this EDSAC computer only used machine language. Uh, 
uh, when I first used it, its total memory capacity was 256, not kilobytes or megabytes, 256 words. And I w well recall the day when we got an extra 256, 512. It seemed as if infinite horizons had opened. <laughs> And I was thinking of it the other day when I added a 20 megabyte hard disk to my own computer. Um, it, uh, this machine, uh, it, it stored its words in mercury delay lines. Uh, there was no thermostatic control. The building did not have central heating like most places in England in those days. So uh, you simply uh, turned the electric fire on when the room got a little cold and turned it off again when the room got a bit warm. And uh, I think that uh, John Bennett and I, John Bennett was an, an Australian uh, graduate student working in the mathematics laboratory in Cambridge and who took me in hand and taught me programming on this machine. Uh, and after I'd learned some programming, um, we did together what I think probably must have been, I believe, the first Fourier synthesis for crystallographic purposes, uh, which, was, uh, which had been done. I think the next slide, please. No, that's a different, that's not. Uh, this, is a, this is in parentheses to show how a little later than the time I'm now describing we were looking much more cheerful about the prospects. <laughs> this, is, uh, this, in fact, is, is the spring of 1956, which was really one year before proteins began to come out. And, uh, and on the left was Anne Cullis, who was Max Perutz's uh, assistant, and then Francis Crick, uh, a gentleman that you may recognize in the audience, Don Casper, uh, Aaron Klug, uh, Rosalind Franklin, Odile Crick and, and myself on the right. So that was a meeting in Madrid, a crystallography meeting, rather like this, in Madrid in 1956. I don't remember who took the photograph. Since he's not in it, it probably must have been Max Perutz with the camera. Uh, the next slide, please. Yes, this is a Patterson projection of myoglobin done on the EDSAC Mark I. And uh, you see, the way we did it was to, uh, to have a grid which corresponded, was distorted, of course. It was the grid set by the, by the, by the, uh, t the line spacing and the number of words per inch and the number of characters per inch. And uh, the, the, the numbers were contours of density, and uh, you, could draw con you could draw a contour map around. So that was one of the early... Uh, Fourier synthesis uh, of uh, protein, and uh, by the way, it was a, um, calculated on a on a on a computer. And by the way, of course, uh, it's it's a shame to say it in the home of Lindo Patterson, but uh, Patterson projections and Patterson synthesis turned out not to be so useful for solving protein structures as had been thought at one time. So the uh, use of these computers was uh, is really essential for the work. The um, number of reflections was such that to have calculated Fourier synthesis by hand using beaver's lips and strips would simply have knocked the whole operation out altogether. And um, uh, in a sense, you might say, perhaps, that... that uh, uh, the situation was, uh, at that time, was a little bit like the situation in genome, sequencing the human genome at the present time. A few years ago, you really couldn't dream of doing it at all because it would take too long. Now we think maybe it can be done if you spend a lot of money, and at this stage we thought maybe the calculations could be done for a protein. 
But even then, they were not exactly straightforward because the, the limited capacity of the machine, the slowness of the machine, the fact that it was very unreliable, that you would go in on a Saturday afternoon hoping to calculate a three-dimensional Fourier synthesis, and you would continue until the machine broke down, which might be Saturday afternoon, it might be Sunday night, uh, and if you could be there till Monday morning, three in the clock in the morning, you had finished your, your synthesis. But that didn't happen very often. When the six angstrom version of myoglobin was first calculated, the Fourier syntheses were carried out on the EDSAC Mark I. Uh, we had not yet programmed phase determination on the EDSAC Mark I. Next slide, please. Um, that was a kind of showpiece slide at the time about our heavy atoms, showing what beautiful phases you might get occasionally. Uh, you see that the... Uh, but, but the next slide will show you how it looked much more often. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, of course, the encouragement we had at that time was that uh, Dorothy did a calculation, I can't remember what of, but a, a calculation in which she simply put all the phases as being plus 90 or minus 90, and the, the result came out more or less right. So we thought, if, however wrong the phases were going to be, at least we would get a recognizable, a recognizable answer. So the three or four hundred phases used for the six angstrom map of myoglobin were all done by hand, and only later, at the later stages, put onto the machine. I may say that uh, while all this was going on, my colleague Max Perutz, who I would describe as being conservative, technologically conservative, he never used the EDSAC because he didn't believe the results. <laughs> and, uh, he continued to use the Hollerith machine, which was available. And I think I'm right in saying that it was only when EDSAC Mark II became available and when Michael Rossman joined Max as a graduate student that uh, Michael uh, converted Max to the idea that, uh, that problems could be solved correctly uh, with, a computer, with an electronic computer. Well, when I went to the art exhibition that you have around the corner, uh, I was reminded about the six angstrom map of myoglobin. In the next slide, please. Yeah, there it is on the right. And you see on the left is a piece of modern sculpture. This slide was made at the time because we were thinking of putting the myoglobin model into a modern art exhibition. I'm really very sorry we didn't do it. I think we might have won a prize, although, uh, although opinions on this subject were divided. Uh, certainly, uh, Lawrence Bragg, I mean, you know, if you remember this quotation, uh, perhaps these are the men or what men or gods are these, what maidens loath, the dancer on the left. Uh, Bragg didn't, like, didn't think of it that way. He thought the myoglobin model was, the word he used was obscene. <laughs> and, um, and he wanted it painted a different color. Um, I don't think we did paint it a different color. Uh, his reaction, however, was not the same as that of Desmond Bernal, because when Bernal first came to see the, the model, he took one look at it and said, I always knew a protein would look like this. <laughs> well, in fact, of course, it was a very serious remark because what Bernal was saying was that he always knew that unlike these uh, facile models like the one I showed you, the Max and myself, or Dorothy Rinch or whoever, uh, he always knew that the protein was going to be an extremely irregular object. And so it was, and that, so it really was a very serious remark and not a joke at all. Well, then came, then came the EDSAC Mark II and a much faster, much faster working. 
And uh, that, again, I think that the Ed without EDSAC Mark II, I do not believe that a 2 angstrom or 1.5 angstrom map of a protein would have been practically possible. So EDSAC Mark II arrived at just exactly the right moment within a few months, just when we were ready with the data. And then came another technological problem, which was building a model. How, if you got the data for a two angstrom map of a protein, how would you build a model of it? This was in the days, of course, before computer graphics. Well, the next slide shows how... We have the next slide. Yeah, I have to apologize. There are some problems with my slides. They are of non-uniform thickness, and therefore I know the projectionist is having some problems getting them in. Well, maybe he will succeed. But at any rate, the, the model-building problem for, uh, for these proteins in the early days was really very difficult without computer graphics. And you probably know, and there's a picture of it, if we ever get it, a picture of it, uh, we, what we did was to have a kind of forest of steel rods with little colored clips on them. The colored clips representing density. And then you took skeleton models and you built them in and around these, in and around these, uh, uh, these uh, rods until you had your model. Now, if the projectionist is in difficulty, we could leave that slide out and have the next one. Maybe that's as bad. No? <laughs> well, uh, well, the next one was models too, and it showed an alpha helix in the uh, an alpha helix among these steel rods. And I am sad not to show it because, of course, there it is. That's the that was the first time we built an alpha helix into the density map. Uh, you see the steel rods there and the little clips on them, which really are coloured, uh, which give the density. And I like showing that slide with Linus here because, of course, this was the first direct demonstration, I think, of the existence of the, of the uh, alpha helix in a crystalline protein. The next slide, with the next one we can have, let's see what it is. Well, that's, in fact, going back a stage, that's the alpha helix at only six angstrom resolution. And uh, the way that was done, it was done one Sunday morning by Bragg and myself. Uh, we, got a, we made a cylindrical section through the six angstrom Fourier of myoglobin. And uh, Bragg, in his garage, found an old handle of a broom, a mop and cut it into sections and got a cylindrical piece of wood and we wrapped the paper round and that was how we got this, we were able to draw this uh, cylindrical section of an alpha helix at, at six angstrom resolution. Next slide, please. And uh, again, I show this because of Linus being here. There's the alpha, the alpha helix at the top and there is the higher resolution two angstrom, or I forget, Yes, I think two angstrom model of myoglobin, uh, and along the top of that Fourier synthesis, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, alpha helix. Well, uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then, of course, um, you could look end on down the alpha helix and and see the hole going down the middle. Next one. And finally, it was, uh, uh, is, um, is the two angstrom model of myoglobin, and uh, you know the nice picture of it by Irving Geis, which is round the corner in the museum. Now, I think that the model building situation, I find, is still unsatisfactory uh, 30 years later, because the advantage, th this kind of model building that I've been describing with the steel rods had one great advantage, that you could put your hands in it, inside it, and you could build the model in and around the density. Uh, you can't do that on a computer screen, and however much, however clever your graphics are, uh, 
you do you have the limitation that you are looking at the model from outside and I think that here's a great gap in the technology that what we need is a three-dimensional kind of model building which would be more effective than the very crude one which we used in those days uh, I am inclined to think that there are a number of other technological gaps in this whole field which either have never been filled or are only now beginning to be filled. Growing, making crystals 30 years later than all this is still a black art. One hears rumors of what you can do in outer space, but uh, for the most part it's still a black art. Mounting crystals. Well, until the work of Hawk on Hoppe, which you heard about yesterday, uh, that technology had remained quite unchanged for 30 years. And Max Perutz, as I tell you, is technologically conservative. If you go into the Cambridge lab any day, you'll still find Max mounting crystals by the method that he taught me in 1945. Totally unchanged, and it's a very good method. Uh, but, the, but, but, but the technology was at a complete standstill for all that time until very recently with this new way of mounting protein crystals. And finally, it seems to me that the heavy atom technique, the technique of putting heavy atoms into proteins is still in the same primitive state as it was then. So. I think what I am saying is that in the 1950s there was a very fortunate conjunction of uh, technological advances without which the work simply could not have been done at that time. If the computer had been 10 years later, the solution of the problem would have come 10 years later. What I notice is that since those days, uh, the there has been a kind of, well, technological standstill would perhaps be too strong a way of putting it, but on the whole, in spite of some substantial advances like synchrotrons, like area detectors, and you can think of many more, on the whole, uh, the te technical advances have been nothing like as important as the ones in the 1950s happened to be. And it, so the 1950s was a very fortunate conjunction of circumstances, turning this, uh, what Francis described as this mad pursuit, into the wild ecstasy of getting the, getting the results. Well, uh, going, this is back to Keats. The next slide, please, um, I think shows the, um, are we going to get that one? Or, yes. This was the team. These were the men or gods and the maidens loath who actually did the work. Uh, it's not up to date, this slide. Uh, it was, this slide must have been made uh, well before the end of the project, because there is one person, I think, here present this afternoon who certainly ought to be on it and isn't, and that's Benno Schoenborn, and I think there are others. So the slide is not dated, but I think the slide must have been about, uh, about the time the two angstrom uh, uh, Fourier synthesis was carried out, and you will notice that it's more an American project than a British project, uh, in spite of having been carried out in Cambridge, England. The number of uh, American names is greater than the number of names from any other, any other country. Well, so that was, uh, that was how it happened, and this, I think that the lesson from this uh, story about the technology is that uh, first, of course, you must have your problem, and then you think about the techniques which are needed to solve it, and not the other way around. Uh, but don't think of the problem too soon, because, uh, <laughs> because if the techniques are so just not there at all, however clever you are about thinking of the problem, you're not going to be able to solve it. Uh, if you think of the problem too late, it's boring. So the secret is to have the problem just when the techniques are becoming available. And that is what happened in the, in the protein field, in, not only in the Cavendish, but everywhere else in the 1950s. And all I can say is how lucky we were that it happened that way. Thank you.
Thank you, John. I perhaps should tell you how I almost succeeded in delaying the determination of the structure of the first globular protein by a year or two. Uh, I was in my laboratory in Pasadena, and a young man in uniform, a flight lieutenant, came in who had just arrived from Burma, perhaps, or some uh, place down there, about 1945, saying that uh, he was on his way back to England and was going to work on determining the crystal structure of a protein, a globular protein molecule by X-ray diffraction. I said, well, that's nonsense. You've never determined the structure of any crystal. You'd better work on something simple, you know, with only a half a dozen atoms in the molecule and uh, get your PhD degree, and by that time you'll have enough experience to attack. John Kendrew was his name. Uh, he ignored my <laughs> advice. So the, the first, uh, I think it's right, the first crystal whose structure he attempted to determine by X-ray diffraction was myoglobin. <laughs> and he succeeded 